morning. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you in Sunday school in our topics class. And we're continuing on in our study of the rapture. And uh, this is the, the seventh lesson in the series on the rapture. Every verse in the Bible on the rapture. And there's a lot of them. And so we are taking it book by book. And today we are in the book of Philippians. And in the book of Philippians, which is just four chapters long, in the book of Philippians, we see seven references to the rapture. That's almost two per chapter. And every single chapter in Philippians talks about the rapture. So we have seven uh, passages to look at today. And so we'll get started. Let's look to God in prayer as we begin. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you again today as on each of the, these Lord's days, humbly beseeching you to teach us from your precious word and to reveal yourself more and more each week to us from the word of God. And Lord, we do pray that the Holy Spirit might be our teacher, our guide, our counselor, and Lord, the one to whom, uh, through whom the Lord Jesus is exalted. And so, Lord, we would pray this day that uh, you give us, a, first of all, an appetite for the Word of God, and secondly, comprehension, to comprehend the Word of God, uh, and that each one of us might be growing in grace and the knowledge of you, and living in anticipation to this great prophetic event that we've been studying. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, in the book of Philippians, seven times he talks about the rapture of the church. And um, you've, the, uh, the first three references are in Philippians 1.6, Philippians 1.10, and Philippians 2.16. And in each one of those three verses, three of the seven that are in Philippians, it refers to the rapture by a particular term. And that particular term is the day of Christ. The day of Christ. Now in the word of God, we have the day of Christ and we have the day of the Lord. Now, we talked about this earlier, but I wanna go a little more into it today. We have the day of Christ, which means the rapture. That's, that's the biblical term for the rapture. The day of the Lord is the revelation. That's Jesus' second coming, when he's revealed from heaven, comes back, sets up his kingdom, and so forth. Now there's a great contrast between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. First of all, the day of the Lord is found, that phrase, the day of the Lord is found 20 times in the Old Testament. And... Um, each time it is referring to the revelation, Jesus' return uh, again. The day of the Lord is only referred to two times in the New Testament. Now, of course, the rapture, the day of Christ, is not referred to at all in the Old Testament because the rapture, the church, none of that was revealed until, until the New Testament. So in the, so in the Old Testament, you have the phrase, the day of the Lord, 20 times, but only twice in the New Testament. And I thought it would be profitable if we would look at those two times before we get into uh, Philippians. I thought it would be profitable if we would look at those two times where it talks about the day of the Lord, and we're going to contrast this with the day of Christ as we read it in Philippians. First of all, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, he says, Yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, there it is, that's one of the two times that it's mentioned here in the scriptures, in the New Testament, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now that thief in the night is a phrase that we find a number of times in the New Testament, and it always, without exception, it always refers to the day of the Lord, never to the rapture. Now I know that there, there is a, a lot of teaching that uh, incorporates that phrase and tries to uh, make it talk about the rapture, but it, that's just not so. That phrase, the coming of as a thief in the night, is always referred to as the day of the Lord. Now the next verse will prove it to you. 
The second time we have in the New Testament, the day of the Lord, is in 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord, there it is, the day of the Lord, it says, will come as a thief in the night. There we have that phrase again. Now what is equated with that day of the Lord when Jesus will come as a thief in the night? We have judgment. It says, the heavens shall pass away with great noise, the elements melt with fervent heat, the earth and all the works that are therein shall be burned up. So the day of the Lord is always equated with judgment. That's Jesus' return uh, at the end of the tribulation, the judgment upon all of that, that follows and on, and then goes on into the millennial kingdom. So the day of the Lord always involves judgment. But the day of Christ does not involve judgment. The day of Christ involves blessing and rejoicing. We're going to see that this morning. And uh, uh, so there's a great contrast between them. Now, in Philippians 1.6, if you notice on your note sheets, right in the middle of the first page, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it, until the day of Jesus Christ. Translation, rapture, the day of Jesus Christ. The second time is in Philippians 1.10, that ye may approve things which are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the rapture, or the day of Christ. And then Philippians 2.16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, the rapture, that I had not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So three times in Philippians, it, uh, as it refers to the rapture as the day of Jesus Christ. Now, not just Philippians, but in other places of the New Testament as well. Just as the Old Testament is full of verses that refer to the day of the Lord, the New Testament is full of verses that refer to the day of Christ. Now, we just put three more in here, uh, but there's more than this. 1 Corinthians 1.8 who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rapture. 2 Corinthians 1.14, uh, also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of Jesus Christ. See, it's, it doesn't talk about any judgment there. It talks about rejoicing and uh, talking about uh, con confirming to the end. Then in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. So here again we have, um, we have and, and by the way, what that verse is talking about is somebody used Paul's name and they forged a letter and they sent it to the Thessalonian church and they told them the rapture was passed and they missed it. You know, think how you'd feel if, if you woke up one morning and you said, well, the rapture was yesterday and we missed it. You know, that, they, were, they were in a frenzy there in, in Thessalonica. And Paul writes Second Thessalonians to, to counter, counter deck, contradict that. He says, you haven't missed the day, the, you know, the, the, the day of Christ is at hand. So the Old Testament is filled with the day of the Lord. The New Testament is filled with the day of Christ. Now we're going to begin our study in Philippi, with Philippians 1.6 here, and we called it the beginner believer because it talks about babes in Christ. It talks about those that are just newly saved. And we're, we will see that the beginner believers, the baby Christians, are going to be raptured. Now let that comfort your heart. Baby Christians New Christians are going to be part of the rapture. See, there is some teaching out here today, around today, that says that only the spiritual Christians are going to be raptured. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. That's not true. All Christians are going to be raptured, and all Christians are going to be raptured at the same time. Some teach that, the, that there is a mid-tribulation rapture and a pre-tribulation rapture, and that the spiritual Christians, they're going to be raptured before the tribulation, uh, but then the, the, uh, the carnal Christians, they're going to get raptured in the middle of the tribulation. No place in the Bible does it teach that. Philippians 
1.6 tells us that even the newborn believers are going to be raptured when the rapture takes place. Let's look at it. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, that's salvation, that's the new birth, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. And I looked up that word perform, and it means to fulfill completely. In another scripture, in 2 Corinthians, that same word is translated finish. So what is he saying here? He which hath begun a good work in you will finish it, or fulfill it completely, until the day of Jesus Christ, or until the rapture. So you get saved on one particular, in one particular moment, and the rapture takes place that next moment, you'll be gone with all the, the whole church will be gathered together at the judgment seat of Christ. It's the, every single one of the believers. Now, um, this verse, like, like most of these verses on the rapture, they don't teach us just about the rapture. Most of these verses teach us some other Bible truths, some, some Bible doctrines. We've seen some of these as we've been studying the rapture. Now, Philippians 1.6 not only does it teach us about the rapture, but it also teaches us two other important Bible doctrines. One, the eternal security of the believer. And we talked about this for the last couple of weeks. This verse teaches us that the believer is eternally secure. He which hath begun a good work in you will finish it. That's security. That's the security of the believer. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 27, My sheep hear my voice and follow me. What does that mean? <laughs> you don't have to be a, a, a rocket scientist to figure that out. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. It means a believer, somebody who has trusted in Christ, is going to be following Jesus. They're going to be hearing the word of God whether it's the verbal word of God or the written word of God, they're going, to be, they're going to hear the word of God and they're going to follow Jesus. And if they're not following Jesus, they're not his sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That's what Paul's talking about here in Philippians 1.6. Now, I, you know, if, if your Uncle Louis was uh, professed to accept Christ 30 years ago and he's been out in the world, living for self, living apart from God for the last uh, 20, 30 years, I got bad news for you. Uncle Louie's not saved. If Uncle Louie was saved, he would be following Jesus. He would be hearing Jesus' voice. Now that's, that's what Jesus and Paul both are, te are teaching here. Being confident of this very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's going to come to its completion. The, the good work, which is the new birth. The good, wor the, uh, good work that God has begun in us. The second doctrine that this verse teaches is the perseverance of the saints. Now, that's not the same as eternal security. The perseverance of the saints. This verse means that God is going to preserve his people. Notice again, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It means that the person who has been saved, he's trusted in Christ, is not going to fall away from God. Now, there may be times when we backslide. We understand that. All of us do that to some degree. Every single one of us, to a certain degree, at certain times, will do that. This is talking about a, a lifestyle here. You're not going to fall away and it just, you know, forsake God and go out in the world and live for the world, the flesh and the devil and so forth. He that hath begun this good work in you will, uh, will come perform it or fulfill it or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is going to preserve his people. Now, if you'll uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians, we have it spelled out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. 
And he even uses the word preserved here. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. Here's the, the pre preserving of the saints here. Body, soul, and spirit preserved, and not just preserved, but look how it's preserved. Blameless. Preserved blameless. How long? Unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, God is going to preserve you until the end. He's going to preserve you until, uh, uh, until the rapture, when he, when he comes back again. Now, we have this also, as you notice on your note sheets there, in Hebrews 6.19. It says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Philippians 1.6 teaches us that we have an anchor, an anchor to our soul. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it. Here's, it's an anchor to our soul. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Enter into that within the veil. The veil is in the temple, the temple is up in heaven, and the veil separates the holy place from the holy of holies, which is the presence of God. What is, what is uh, Hebrews 6.19 saying? It's saying that we have an anchor for our soul, which is anchored in God's presence in the holy place in the tabernacle in heaven. How much more secure than that can you get? We are anchored in eternity. Not just in eternity, but in the presence of God in eternity. That's our anchor. No wonder Paul could write, I'm confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun the good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So uh, th those are two great doctrines that are taught in in this verse, along with the rapture itself, the eternal security of the believer and the perseverance of the saints. Then the second, um, uh, we called that the beginning believer, and we, we said that the beginning believer, the baby Christian, is going to be raptured. Then we go to the better believers, and these are the mature Christians. They also are going to be raptured, and that's in our second reference in Philippians, and that's Philippians 1.10. So we've entitled this, The Better Believers. These are the Christians that have gotten saved, but have matured as, as, uh, as believers, uh, believers. Philippians 1.10. That ye may approve things that are excellent, and that word excellent means better. That you may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense, how long? Till the day of Christ, or till the rapture. And so this is not talking about the, the baby believers. This is talking about the mature believers, those that have grown in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. All of this, this rapture takes place at the same time whether you are a baby Christian or a mature Christian. You're all going to be raptured at, at one and the same time. And so the, the, uh, what, it, what we're talking about here is um, things that are excellent, those that have gone on to better things. Now, in the, again, in the book of Hebrews, he spells out those better things. Look in your notes there, Hebrews 6, 9. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. In Philippians 1.10, he says things that are excellent. And in uh, Hebrews 6.9, he says better things. The things that are excellent, are, remember, excellent means better. Uh, so we, in, in both these verses, he's talking about better things. Better than what? Better than just accepting Christ and using Jesus as a fire escape out of hell. And this is what some people seek to do. And as, uh, if you heard uh, Pastor uh, Woody this morning, as he preached in the morning service there, about the man who wrote, and he said he just wants $3 worth of God, and has just, uh, just wants just enough of God so he doesn't, so he, he 
won't go to hell, but doesn't want a whole lot of, of God. You know, that, that's, that's a shameful thing. That's, that's sometimes a beginning believer will, will, will want to do that. But the better believer, he's gone on and he's matured in the things of God, the things that are excellent. Look at, at Hebrews 6, 9 here. Beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. And what does he call them? Things that accompany salvation. Things that accompany salvation. From the starting with the day that you got saved, there should be things that have come into your life from that point on, things that were not there before, things that are there now, things that accompany salvation. Better things they are referred to in Hebrews 6, 9. The better things. Now what are these, uh, are these better things? Well, in Galatians 5, 22, he lists some of them. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Those are some of the better things. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. Better things, all things become new. A transformed life. The Bible teaches a transformed life. And with that transformed life, comes spiritual maturity, people growing in the things of, of, of the Lord. You know, there is, uh, to be a pastor of a church, uh, you get onslaught from the world, and we're, we're to expect that because the world is, is the enemy. But most of the problems that a pastor faces, and I'm not talking exclusively about this church, I'm talking about any church anywhere. Most of the problems that the pastor faces comes from immature believers. Believers that are still just living in the flesh and uh, want to do things their way and fulfill the, the fleshly lusts and desires and so forth. And so you have all kinds of problems amongst believers. That ought not to be. And uh, uh, when, you be, when you mature as a Christian, those carnal things should, should fall away. They should, they should drop by the wayside. So the, um, uh, the, the new birth should produce a growing and a maturing process within each one of you. And the baby Christians, they're going to be part of the rapture. The better Christians, they're going to be part of the rapture also. Now it's an interesting fact of nature that most creatures, whether it be man or animals, or even plants, most of them <clears throat> grow and there's a limit to their growth. For instance, um, uh, a baby that is born, uh, you can pretty much figure that he's gonna grow and he's going to get up to maybe six foot or maybe maybe six four or something like that. <clears throat> there's going to be a limit to it. He's not going to just keep on growing. But there's part of God's creation that there is no limits of growth. Turtles, for one thing, turtles grow as long as they live. A turtle just keeps right on growing. There are you know, and turtles live over a hundred years. And there's some of those sea turtles they have. Those, those things are monstrous things because they keep growing. They start out a little dinky turtle, but they grow and grow and grow. They never stop. And reptiles are another example. They grow and grow and grow. They never stop growing. I was thinking about that. You know, the days before the flood, um, you, you have this long, tremendous long lifespan. I got thinking about dinosaurs. They're a reptile. I just wonder if they got so big simply because they lived about a thousand years and they grow their whole lifetime. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that make sense? How, how they, they got so big? Reptiles that just keep growing. Well, when God talks about our spiritual growth, he's talking here about growing our whole lifetime. There's no limits to our spiritual growth. We don't reach six feet tall and then stop growing. You know, the human race reaches a certain height and stops growing this way and then usually start growing <laughs> this way. But that's not the kind of growth we're talking about. Um, 
we, we have limits of growth. But spiritually, there are no limits of growth. If I read my Bible right, the Word of God tells us here that we are to be sincere and without offense, which means we're to grow and mature in the Lord till the day of Christ. So as long as we're here, you need to be growing. You need to be uh, more mature spiritually, more mature today than you were yesterday, and more mature yesterday than you were the day before. The growth process doesn't, doesn't stop. And so um, uh, th this is what we refer to here as the better believers. It begins at salvation and it continues until the rapture. And then we have <clears throat> the next reference is uh, Philippians 2.16. There's the third reference. And we call this the, uh, the Bible believers. Well, these are all Bible believers, but this is referring to here the spiritual Christians. They also are going to be raptured. The baby Christians, the mature Christians, and the spiritual Christians, all going to be part of the rapture at one and the same time. Let's look at Philippians 2.16. It says, holding forth the word of life. That's the Bible. Paul says that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. There's the rapture. Notice it's accompanied with rejoicing, not like the day of the Lord, judgment and fire and all of that. It says that I may rejoice in the day of Jesus Christ that I had not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And that phrase there that the, <clears throat> at the beginning of the verse, holding forth the word of life. This is what will cause the rejoicing at the rapture. And I, I got curious about that phrase, holding forth. What does that mean, holding forth? So I looked it up and it's kind of, kind of interesting. It's a, it's a Greek word that is spelled E-P and then the word echo, E-C-H-O. Ek, uh, I'm sorry, ep echo is the way it's pronounced, ep echo. And it has the word echo in it. What is an echo? Well, as an echo is repeating, or you know, you, 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 you are someplace where uh, there's an echo, you, you speak, you can hear your voice, you hear the same thing over again. I think a lot of times these um, politicians that we have today are nothing more than an echo. They, they all repeat each other. They get a little catchphrase and then, then they all use it. Well, holding forth, that phrase, holding forth, has the idea of it of heeding and retaining what you hear. It's an echo. And so a preacher might get up and preach. Well, in fact, just as an example, uh, Pastor Woody this morning, he's preached about the, uh, the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, you're getting an echo here in this class. We've been on it for a long time, uh, talking about for seven weeks now, talking about the rapture. I believe the Spirit of God does that. I believe the Spirit of God leads different men to echo one another when it comes to spiritual truth, giving forth the word of life, holding forth the word of life. And so um, this is a sad commentary today that those who are holding forth the word of life, which we are to do until the day of Christ, until the rapture, it is a sad commentary today that those, there are those who believe and live God's word that are scoffed and mocked and ridiculed and laughed at and so forth. And I made a list of people that, that are the mockers, the scoffers, the ones that ridicule and laugh, and it seems like they all start with the letter D. Deceived people, they're deceived. They wouldn't make fun of you for believing God's word if they weren't deceived. The Bible says, in whom the God of this world hath deceived, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. They're depraved people. They hate spiritual truth, hate the word of God. They're degenerate people. They're disloyal people. Many of them are druggy people. They, they want their sin and their drugs more than the word of God. Going next page. They're dysfunctional people. They're defiled people. They're detestable people. They're dishonest people. Many are drinkers. Many are devils. And folks, sorry to tell you this, but many are Democrats. <laughs> now, now you say, what, it, what do you mean by that? I want to tell you a sad, sad thing. Howard Dean is the head of the Democratic National Convention. John Kerry was the presidential candidate. 
both of them publicly and repeatedly ridiculed George Bush because he believed the Bible. How low can you sink? And this is where our society has sunk to today. That is low, uh, as low as you can get. There was a day, and it's not that far back, where every politician gave lip service to the Bible, whether he believed it or not. I remember back in 1952 and 1956, Adelaide Stevenson, both those years he ran for president. He was a Democrat, ran against Eisenhower. He got trounced both times. Adlai Stevenson was a Unitarian. Unitarians are notorious, they do not believe the Bible. But even though he was a Unitarian, Adlai Stevenson used to give lip service to the Word of God. He used to quote scripture, why? Not because he believed it, but because he knew that the American public thought that was good. And uh, Lyndon Johnson used to quote scripture. Uh, John Kennedy uh, used to quote scripture. That was something that used to be a part of the political scene. Today, it's ridiculed. And how bad can it get? Ronald Reagan, when he was president of the United States, Ronald Reagan gave a speech in which he referred to Armageddon. He took the heat over that. Oh, the president of our country, he's building his foreign policy on something out of the Bible, because he was talking about the Star Wars initiative, and he referred to that we could be heading for Armageddon, and the, all the liberals went ballistic over that. In another era, he would have been praised, uh, praised for that. And uh, so you can't hold forth the word of life and be a liberal, you just, you just can't. Now on the last sheet of your note paper, I added this on after the, lesson, the lessons were already run, but this is an article out of the Washington Times that was published on July the 8th, so it's just, it's two months old. And it was, it's the results of a Harris poll. Now I don't know what prompted uh, Lou Harris to, to, to take this particular poll, but he did and it's about evolution. And this particular poll begins by saying, 64% of us agree that human beings were created directly by God according to a Harris poll released yesterday. So total, 64% of Americans believe in creation as opposed to evolution. But if you drop down just below the middle of the page, it says where it says simian heritage. You know what that means? That man came from monkeys, okay, or apes, the ape family. It says simian heritage was more popular, a more popular theory among Democrats. However, according to the poll, 61% of Democrats think man and ape evolved from the same family tree. Only 30% of Republicans think that way. I've never seen a poll like this before where it talks about a subject like evolution and breaks it down between Democrats and Republicans. Well, you can see here, and that's not saying Republicans are Christians and Democrats aren't. That's not saying this at all. What we're saying is here that the majority of Democrats and the minority of Republicans believe that man evolved out from apes. I mean, this is where our country has gone to. Holding forth the word of life will cause rejoicing in the day of Christ and those that are ridiculing the holding forth of the word of life are those that are uh, not going to be part of, of the rapture. They're, they ridicule it. As Peter said, and there's come in the last days, that's right now, the last days, uh, scoffers walking after their own lust. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that. Now the next four verses concerning the rapture, refer to the, the calling, the citizens, the change, and the conclusion. Number four here is Philippians 3.14, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The prize there, we get that at the rapture. That's where the prize, the crowns, the rewards, that's where they're given out. Our life is to be 
pressing towards that mark. Pressing towards that mark. We're to be moving forward, working for that prize, seeking to obtain that prize. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, so run that you may obtain, referring to that prize. He says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Notice our calling is a high calling. You know what that's saying? If you're a Christian, don't be a low life. We have a high calling. As a Christian, we need to take the high road. Uh, we have a, have a high calling of God. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about our calling and it tells us who gets called. And you don't read a high life here. You read here that you see your calling, brethren, not many wise men, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, weak things of the world, base things, things which are despised, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Who does God save? Who does God choose? He doesn't save the high and the mighty necessarily. Not many of them, it says. He, he saves a few of them. But basically, it's the average citizen, the one that would fit the category of, uh, of uh, uh, foolish and weak and base and despised and so forth. This, the, average, uh, the, the average citizen. But he transforms that average citizen into one who is called by a high calling. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, two more great Bible doctrines are taught or referred to here in this verse. One is personal holiness. We are called with a high calling. God wants us to live holy lives. It's true that sheep don't like dirt, mud holes, and swine do. And the sheep might fall in the mud hole, but he'll scramble out. The pig will fall in the mud hole and just wallow and enjoy every minute of it. We are called with a high calling. Our life ought to be a high life based on that high calling. So personal holiness is one of the doctrines that is taught in this verse. The second doctrine that is taught in this verse is the doctrine of separation. The Bible says, Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Come out from amongst the world. Live separate and apart from the world. Not because you're better than the world, but because you're different from the world. And so the, our, our calling there is a high calling. And this high calling is, is uh, spoken of here in reference to the rapture. Press towards the mark for the prize of that high calling. In other words, God is going to reward you as, as to that high calling. If, you're high, if your life has been a high life, that will um, uh, glorify that high calling. You live a low life, no prize. Then the next reference in Philippians is in number five here is the citizens, and that's in Philippians 3.20. And the word conversation there means citizenship. For our conversation is in heaven, which means our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We look for Jesus. There's the rapture. We look for Jesus. Uh, turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show you a great verse in regard to this idea of our citizenship being in heaven. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We are fellow citizens citizens with the saints in the household of God. And in Philippians we read that that citizenship is in heaven. Citizens of heaven. As Christians we 
have a dual citizenship. We're citizens of whatever country you, you, you live in, but you're also a citizen of heaven. Dual citizenship. And we are traveling today in a foreign land. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. We're traveling in a foreign land, but we're looking, as we travel, we're looking for the Savior. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we're traveling in this foreign land, as strangers and pilgrims, we're to be looking for Jesus. And in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, we read that this is talking about the, the, the great heroes of faith. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's what we are, strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This world is not our home. And I hope you don't regard this world as your home. Our citizenship is in heaven. If you're saved, you're a citizen in heaven and a fellow citizen with the saints of God. And in Hebrews 11, it goes on and says, For they that say such things declare plainly they seek a country. Not an earthly country. We, we live in the best country on earth. But our citizenship is not on earth, it's in heaven. Your citizenship got transferred the day you got saved. Citizenship got transferred from this earth to glory. Citizens of heaven. And then in that same 11th chapter of Hebrews it says, but now they desire a better country that is a heavenly, a heavenly country. That's where our citizenship is today. So we have a citizenship in heaven and it'll, we'll, we'll realize that at the rapture according to Philippians 3.20. Then the sixth reference to the rapture is in Philippians 3.21, the very next verse. We entitled this, or labeled this, the change. Because when that rapture takes place, there's going to be a fantastic change take place. It says in Philippians 3.21, speaking of Jesus, who shall change our vile bodies. This body is referred to as a vile body because it's flesh. It's contaminated by the flesh. It is flesh. Who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, his resurrection body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This is what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians when he said, this mortal shall put on immortality and this corruptible shall put on incorruption. This body is going to be instantaneously, remember it said in 1 Corinthians, at the twinkling of an eye, one three hundred thousandths of a second, scientifically speaking, who shall change this vile body. And it's going to be made unto like Jesus' glorious body. Do you think that you maybe could use a brand new, perfect, healthy, immortal incorruptible body. I know I could. Amen. And every year <laughs> I realize this more and more. Well, we're going to. It's coming. That new body is coming. That transformed body, that, that incorruptible body, that immortal body, it's coming when the rapture takes place. Now you may be living, you may be dead. It don't matter. Because if you're dead, your old body will go in the grave, but that new body will come out of the grave. And if you're a living, that body will be changed even as you, we begin the ascent upward in a split second, the moment, the twinkling of an eye, and we'll have, that, we'll have that new body. And it's immortal, it is eternal, and uh, we can't wait to get it. No pain, that body won't be subject to pain, it won't be subject to disease and illness, it won't be some subject to aging. Man, I'll tell you, aging will do it to you. <laughs> it, you know, you go along and uh, things, things are uh, going along okay, you know, you may have a few little problems here and there, but when you start getting older, you get pains and, and uh, you, you get aches and you get stiffness in your joints and, and you get 
this, that, and the other thing. And, and uh, it's all part of this old body. It's, it's in the process of corrupting, it's decaying. But we got a perfect one waiting for us at the rapture. So that great change is going to take place. Who so change our vile bodies. Then the final reference to the rapture in Philippians is in Philippians 4, 5. It says, let your moderation, and moderation means to be gentle, mild, and patient. Are you, are you a Christian that's gentle, mild, and patient? I shouldn't ask you, I should ask your spouse. Are they gentle, mild, and patient? <laughs> okay. okay. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Why? The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. You don't know when he's coming because it happened at any time. So live with moderation, gentle, mild, and patient. And Jesus taught that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and, he, and, and there was a lot of prophetic signs connected with that. But as far as the rapture are, are concerned, the rapture is, is at hand, but there's no prophetic signs connected with it. Now, back in, wor in the days of World War II, actually just before World War II started and, and right after in the early days of World War II, there were many Bible believers who were considering the fact that Adolf Hitler might be the Antichrist. Well, as we know, hindsight is 2020. Adolf Hitler's dead and gone, and he certainly was not the Antichrist. But there was a lot of things about Adolf Hitler that made people think he could be the Antichrist. And, but, but if they had really looked at their Bibles closer, there would be at least four reasons why Hitler could not possibly have been the Antichrist. Number one, the church was still here. The rapture hadn't taken place yet. So he couldn't be the Antichrist, because the Antichrist isn't revealed till after the church is raptured. Secondly, Europe was not united yet, and because the Bible teaches that when Europe is united, it's going to be done peaceably, just like is happening right now. But Hitler was, if he was uniting Europe, he was not doing it peaceably. He was doing it with warfare, and he never did unite it. He, he conquered much of it, but didn't unite it. The third reason, and this is even a stronger reason, the Jews were not a nation back then. The Jews were not a nation. When the Antichrist is revealed, Israel has to be a nation living in her own land. And that certainly was not true. Now, Hitler was killing Jews right and left, killed six, six million of them. But they weren't a nation. They were in all the nations of Europe where he was killing them. And then the fourth reason, Hitler never signed any covenant with the Jews, and, and the Antichrist is going to do that. He's going to sign this covenant with the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel didn't even exist in the days of Hitler. So, the, um, the idea here that uh, Hitler was the Antichrist uh, and that that time was at hand could not possibly have been true. There were certain prophetic signs that had not been fulfilled that had to be fulfilled before the Antichrist is revealed, or when the Antichrist is revealed. Now the rapture, on the other hand, nothing has to happen first. There are no prophetic signs that have to be revealed. Paul says here in Philippians 4, 5, the Lord, speaking of the rapture, the Lord is at hand. It can happen at any moment. You don't have to be any covenant signed with Israel. Doesn't have to be any prophetic events fulfilled. Doesn't have to be uh, the, the rise of this nation or that nation or the uniting of these nations. None of that has to be fulfilled. He says the Lord is at hand. It can happen at any particular time. That's why we say the rapture is a signless and timeless event. Nothing has to happen first. No prophecies have to be fulfilled. It can happen at any time. And only God knows when that time is. That's why Paul concludes the book of Philippians here by saying, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Live every minute like Jesus is coming today. Let your moderation be known unto all men. So this brings us to the close of the rapture 
in Philippians. If you need any of the back lessons, we have them laying up here. And uh, today is Communion Sunday. So as soon as the uh, class is over, there will be uh, at 11 o'clock will be the communion service down in the chapel downstairs. You're invited to come. The, the Lord bids us all to, uh, to come to his table. And uh, I like one more announcement I'd like to um, make you aware of is starting next Sunday night, um, evening Sunday school, evening BLT is going to be starting. And um, we'll be teaching a seven week class during the uh, during the evening Sunday school. And it's a subject I've never, ever touched before in my life. And the, the name of this class is, going, is, is the real meaning of the zodiac. Now, I'm sure you know what the zodiac is, those astrological signs. Uh, these are what the astrologers, and, and that's a false thing. The Word of God says have nothing to do with astrology. It's condemned repeatedly throughout the Old Testament. But where did it come from? There's a real meaning of the zodiac. And this was known to mankind for 2,500 years before the word of God ever began to be written. And we're gonna be dealing with the zodiac and see the gospel message, which is written in the stars, in the sky, that the whole human race had access to before they had a written word of God. So we're gonna be starting that next Sunday night at six o'clock and you're invited to come. It's a, it's a topic we've never dealt with before and um, I'm sure it will be a blessing to you. Now then, if you will stand together and look this way, we have a benediction from the Word of God to share with you from the book of Jude. And Jude chapter 20 says, But beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And in this benediction it goes on and says, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, in glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming.